Okay, Romans 15, if you will. We're going to get started here. Uh, we're, we, we got down through verse 24 last time. So we're going to pick up reading verse 24 and uh, read down through where we're going to get hopefully this morning. Uh, verse 24, Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you. If first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When, therefore, I have performed this, and have sealed to you, I'm sorry, sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. Obviously, Paul's heart's desire is to get to Spain. He mentioned it a couple times. And again, scripturally, bases, we don't know if he got there. So we're, scripture's silent. We'll be silent about it. However, he does have that desire, so there's no telling if he really did or not. Uh, in, in the canon of scripture, it's not there. And by the way, you ought to appreciate your scriptures in that manner. It is of no importance whether he got there or not, because it's not listed. The things, if you come over to the end of the, of the Gospel of John, just to give you an idea of why we say that, uh, John 20, if you will, John 20 and verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, in the Gospel of John, there's literally only seven miracles, seven things that he does in, in the book. Eight if you count Calvary, but seven that he does in the Gospel of John. There's much more in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Come over to chapter 21 and verse 24. This is the disciple which testified these things and wrote these things. And we know that the, his testimony is true. And there are so also many other things which Je Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Boy, what a testimony. That means that what's in the canon is there for your, and it's all that you need, okay? It's there for your, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, when we come in here to Romans 15 and we look at this issue here of whether he went to Spain or not, that isn't the issue. The issue is, is what is he telling those at Rome? He hasn't been to Rome yet. Verse 24, I want to get there because I want to be filled with your company. I want to meet you. I want to see you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to, verse 20, uh, Romans 15 now, verse 29, and I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. I, I want to get there. I want to be there with you. I, I want to come and, and see you face to face. And when I do, verse tw now verse 29 we'll get in two weeks, because next week I won't be here. But he says, when I do come, I'm going to come in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. He, Paul understands that he was going to get more information, more revelation, okay? There was more doctrine to be revealed to Paul as he's, tra as he's going, and as he's going to get there, he, he understands that the book of Romans doesn't contain all the doctrine. He understands that there's more doctrine coming. He understands that doctrine in Romans is laying the foundation. Those, those four tiers of justification, sanctification, identification, walk. And then we're not Israel. We're the body of Christ. And now the grace application of all of that. He understood that that didn't cover all of it. And we've seen that as we've come through Romans of where he'll say, well, like in chapter 12, he talks about their signs. But he doesn't say how you get them, who's giving them, who's getting what, what, how this works. He just says, when you have a gift, this is the attitude in which you're to do in the relationship with other members of the body. He talks about the judgment seat of Christ in 14. He doesn't say anything about it. He just says, you're going to stand there. So let's be ready, and let's help the weaker brother 
get ready for that day. So he understands, and again, he's wanting to come and see them. And he knows that when he gets there, he'll be able to, to continue the edification process with them. We get into the book of Ephesians, we get an advanced doctrine on the church and the corporate and the big picture and so forth. By the way, in chapter 16, he's going to identify a number of saints at Rome, even though he's never been there physically. That's phen phenomenal that they've had interaction with Paul. In, in, in Corinthians, he'll say, the care of the church is daily. You know, he's getting the carrier pigeon every, every hour. Bam, bam, download, boom. Emails, bam. You know, we'll, we call them emails today. Why? Because he, he's, he is the apostle. But for now, verse 25, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. So you have to think about this. He wants to go to Rome. Actually, he wants to go to Spain. On my way to Spain, I'm going to stop by you at Rome. But first, I got to go take care of something in Jerusalem. Okay? And he says, verse 26, the end of the verse, For the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Paul is now going to draw our attention as he's wrapping up the book of Romans. And Paul does this in every epistle. Every epistle, Paul lays out the doctrine, okay? The reproof, the correction, whatever the doctrine is. And then at the end of the book, he gives a real live, in the flesh illustration of what he just taught you in the doctrine. Nine out of ten times he uses himself. Here he's going to use the churches of Macedonia and Achaia. Macedonia, the Corinthians, the Thessalonians, the Philippians. That er we don't have the map up this morning. I guess I could have had Ricky do that. I didn't even think about it. But that area of this, of this part of the world, and they want to do something here because they're understanding, verse 27, it has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, and we have, that's what we've learned in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. The Gentiles are now able to come to salvation outside of the nation of Israel, but now salvation has come unto the Gentiles. Okay? We're able now, the guy, the, think about that. The Gentiles, the cast out people. The, we're on the outside looking in. We've, we are the objects of wrath and disdain. We're the enemies of the nation of Israel, and yet now what are we? We're the vessels of honor. We're the vessels of mercy, grace, and peace. So now Paul's going to, he's going to use a, Real life, well, we were good until the Raiders walked in. Oh, man. Sorry. That's worth interrupting the show. Okay? All right. Okay. We'll, we'll let him sit. He needs to be down front then, in that, so I can. All right. We're going to be on this side of the pulpit today. No. <laughs> He's going to use this real live illustration here of what we're just learning. Okay? And he's gonna, what he's going to do now is he's going to bring in, and he's going to talk about, uh, look, look up at, at uh, verse 28. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this what? Fruit. He's going to talk about fruit. He's going to talk about some, some financial relief here. And what this is literally going to be is a fantastic lesson on the power of grace on the work of grace, the saints at Jerusalem. If you look down at verse 31, that I may deliver from them that do believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accept, accepted of the saints. That's fascinating, the saints. And Paul, again, he's going to divert his, his travel plans to to go to Jerusalem first and, and deliver the, this fruit, this financial aid. He's going to Jerusalem for the primary reason to provide financial aid. Okay? 
And he's going, the end of verse 26, for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. And you have to always remember, you and I are not the only saints in Scripture. Think about saint, sanctified. A saint is defined by one who is set apart. So the term saint is a general term. The context is going to tell you who we're talking about. Who are we talking about? The poor saints where? At Jerusalem, see. So when we talk here, there's some saints in Jerusalem who need some help now because of the change in the program. They need, and again, the saints there, that's the little flock. That's the believing remnant. That's the circumcision believers. And what Paul is going to do here in illustrating out Really, what we just learned earlier in the chapter, he's going to illustrate the power of grace, the risk of grace. I heard it called the gamble of grace. Can you imagine? There's a gamble here in grace. Why? Because it's a risk of faith. We're going to see as we go through here, Paul never made a demand of the Gentile churches to support the poor saints at Jerusalem. Because grace doesn't demand anything. Grace says, I want you to be motivated by. See, the law says, thou shalt do. There's the demand. So there's a risk here. There's a gamble here of faith. And the and what Paul's going to do here, again, is something just wonderful and illustrating out He's, God is going to provide for that believing remnant of Israel. Galatians 6 calls them the Israel of God. And he's going to do it by the hands of the body of Christ, the Gentiles. Why? Verse 27. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things... Their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. It's very clear. What does the church, the body of Christ, understand? They understand that, hey, here's this little group of believers down here doing what their program told them to do. God changed the program. Now we're blessed with the exceeding riches of His grace. By the way, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings. We don't care about the physical. I know we, you know, this morning I woke up and going, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> a little too much activity yesterday. Why? Why? Because we just get older. It's common to man. Romans 8, we've already learned that we live in the, in the dispensation of suffering. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. So we have a mindset. But the point is here is he's going to do something and he's going to illustrate it out. He's going to really illustrate verse 7. Go back up 15.7. Wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Isn't that interesting? Here's the Gentiles. Ephesians 2. Look over there. Just Ephesians 2. Just to remind you. Ephesians 2 verse 11 and 12. Think about this. Here here, here he's going to use this illustration here of going and providing help to to that believing remnant down there. And he's going to do it, and it's going to be a demonstration of everything that we've learned to this point in the doctrines learned in the book of Romans. Historically, in the moment, in Paul's day, first century, now you can't do this today. There are no poor saints in Jerusalem today. You know why? They all died. It's been a long time since the first century. Okay? The Jewish folks today need to be what? Saved. They need to hear Paul's gospel, that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again the third day, and trust that, and that alone, faith alone, and then they're what? They're not little flockers. They're body of Christers. Okay? to use the, the, the lingo of the day out there in, in the uh, attack world, okay? See, so when we're talking about something that Paul's using historically in the moment, 
Ephesians 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember, I love that, Paul, remember. You know why? Because we get going. This is a book of Ephesians. This is advanced doctrine. He should never have to tell us to remember. But what do we sometimes need to do? We need to remember because we get going, right? Remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that's Genesis 17, 13, where God divided out and said, listen, Abraham, if you're going to be in, on the right side of my covenant with Abraham, you're going to get the sign of circumcision. That's the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. That's what's going to do it. And we're going to put you on this side and you on the rebels on this side. There they are. You can blame Tim down front. Rebels. Rebels. Okay. And we're going to put the believers over here. And then, all right. But notice the name calling in verse 11. In the who are called uncircumcision. Paul tells Peter in Galatians 2, we'll look at it next hour a little bit. Or maybe, no, a little bit here later this hour maybe, if I get off these rabbit trails. And he sits there and he says, we are not as the sinners of the Gentiles. That's name calling, see. Verse 12, that at that time, what time? Time passed. Back there underneath Israel's program. Ye, the Gentiles, were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And we've looked at this when we went through chapter 15, or chapter 15, verse 8, 9, 10, 11 there. He's not saying that Israel will, uh, the Gentiles are never going to get be able to get saved in the program. What he's talking about there is God never had direct covenant relationships with the Gentiles. His people were Israel, and through Israel, this is how they're going to go. And until that changes, how is a Gentile going to get converted? He's got to go through the nation of Israel. Perfect example is Jonah with Nineveh. Jonah didn't want Nineveh. He wa Jonah wanted Nineveh weighed laced by weighed, laid waste. Um, I'm in the waste management, okay? Laid waste by by God. He didn't want them converted at all, so he went the other way. God deals with him, gets him back over. The whole city believes, and what does God do? He doesn't kill, destroy them. He says, okay, they're in. That whole city became Jew, if you will. Now, they're, who are, they're a bunch of Gentiles, but what they do? They believed in the, Abra the God of Abraham. But how? Through who? Through Jonah. Okay? Here you and I are. First century, when this time passed, we're, we are not exactly the most popular people, okay, at all. But now, what are we? Verse 13, 213. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Isn't that interesting? For he is our peace, who has made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Genesis 17, that wall goes up, circumcision. Now what? Nothing, no circumcision availeth anything now. What's important to Christ? The new creature. So when you come back to, to Romans 15, he says, listen, how did Christ receive you under the glory of God? Verse 7. That's how you are to receive those poor saints at Jerusalem down there now. See. And what he's doing, by the way, verse 8, 15, 8, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the Father. What's God doing today? He's receiving the Gentiles, verse 7. That's what he's doing. He wasn't doing that back here. He's doing that now. So he changed that program, and when he did, that impacted Israel's program. Were you with me? So when we look at this issue about who the saint, these saints are and why they're being helped out here, again, it's the little flock. If you look over at Galatians 6, I'll show you the verse. Galatians 6:16. 6, the little flock, the believing remnant, you know what they they believe they're still the beloved of God. <laughs> they're still 6:16. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. 
That's not the whole nation. That's that little flock. How do you know that? Acts 7, Stephen declared the whole nation to be uncircumcised in heart and ears. They're heathen. But that little flock, that circumcision believers, they're the Israel of God. So he loves, he loves, he cares for them. Again, where are we at in human history? First century. Think about what they just did. They just learned. <laughs> they just heard that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Come back to Luke 12. They just heard that. But the kingdom didn't show up. Think about that. Now who's going to care for them? God, through the 12 apostles, told, through the Lord Jesus Christ, too, he told them that he would care for them. If they obeyed his commandments, he would care for them. He would put them in that kingdom over there. He would provide for them. And yet, when he interrupted the program, what's the question now? Now what? Now what is he going to do? And now he's going to pro provide for them by using the Gentile assemblies, the body of Christ. And again, he never commands. He never dictates. And yet Paul, as we're going to see, he's going to write in such a way that we're going to discover that ultimately what God expected is what took place. Again, no commands, no, no demands, but yet we're going to see that God is confident that His grace would compel and empower the very ones who were viewed as inferior, who were viewed as objects of disdain and wrath. And now God says, to those people, the Gentiles, you know my grace. It's what? Sufficient. So why don't you look over there and go do for them at Jerusalem, the saints at Jerusalem. Why? You see how I received you? You're now the stronger and they are the weaker. And what are you to do? You're to go receive them. You see what? He, tremendous illustration of his grace and the act and the working of the doctrine you got Luke 12 okay it's just like Paul's looking at them and saying are you going to live in the past and condemn them they treated me bad or are you going to look at them as who are you going to look at them and do to them what Christ did for you and receive you why would he receive you, Gentile? Because of his grace. See? Okay? Now we can all be done and go get coffee and donuts, right? <laughs> nice try. The question, why are they poor? Okay? Why, why, why does Paul, the, the poor saints at Jerusalem? Well, look at Luke 12. Luke 12, and again, there's a ton of these verses, but we can run them, and we can see it here, Luke 12, 22. And he said unto his disciples, so there's the Lord talking to the, to the disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. You know what he's saying there? There's something bigger here than the physical, it's the spiritual, guys. That's what he's saying. You see, take, consider the ravens, Right? Middle of that verse, and God did what? Feeds them. See, verse 27, consider the lilies, how they grow and toil not. They spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, see that? Verse 29, and seek not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. What are, what are, the, what's the, what are, what are they looking for? They're looking for the physical, aren't they? Israel goes to Solomon and says, 
or Solomon, Samuel, we want a king like the Gentiles. No, you don't. Well, yeah, we do. No, the Father knows you have physical needs. Verse 31, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God. Matthew, he says, but rather seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then he says, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What's the next word, next verse? Sell that ye have. And give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. Why would you have such an idea? For where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. Where should their treasure have been? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. What are they worried about? Physical needs. So he's but how, but look at the command in verse thirty four three. Sell that ye have. How are you doing on that? When the religious guys get to yakking about following Jesus, have you sold out for Jesus? See? Well, we didn't literally mean that you sell everything. He did, though. See, what they can't do today, because by the way, if you sell everything and you bring it and lay it at my feet, I'm probably going to give it back to you because you're going to need it. Because it doesn't work that way today. I knew a gentleman, he, he, took the, he took the stuff in Acts, we're going to go see it, and he sold everything. He'd have even sold the house, except it was in his mother-in-law's name, and he couldn't because he was obeying the verses. He goes to the preacher that told him those verses, and the preacher has the audacity. Well, I didn't really mean literally go do it. The Lord literally meant sell everything. Come along. So, why? The Father knows you needs, and he'll provide for them, but spiritually, you got to get right. you got to be born again, the whole bit here. Come on over to, to, Luke, to chapter 18. This theme about why are these guys poor? Because they believe the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe the 12 apostles. They believe the messianic message to them of sell everything because the kingdom's coming right down the road here in a few years. And when that kingdom shows up, you're going to get it back like Job got it back. You see, they didn't doubt the message. Christians today doubt this a little bit. Why? Because it doesn't work. They know. By the way, most people know this doesn't work. But yet, where are they most of the time? Right in this stuff. Because the preacher uses it to control you, to keep you under that thumb. That's not grace, folks. Grace is freedom, liberty. You decide. You want to do that. If you want to sell out and bring it over here and give it to me, that's on you. That's between you and the Lord. I ain't going to tell you to do that. But if you tell me you're following Luke, then I'm going to smack you upside the head and give it figuratively. Okay? not literally, and give it back to because you're going to need it. Luke 18, verse 22. You can tell this frustrates me a little bit, okay? Well, because we get phone calls here at least two a day on the machine. That's why it's a machine, and I don't answer it. And you know what people are doing? I'm hurting. I need help. I need, I need, I need. And I, years ago, I used to call them back and talk to them. I don't do it anymore because... I know what they're going to say. You know what they're going to say? Well, I'm following Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I literally had a guy tell me that. I said, well, you're following the wrong message, dude. I didn't call him dude. I talked to him. Okay. But that's what they're doing. And then you come to me to bail you out because of your lack of understanding? I don't know. How, anyway, 1822. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, again, this is the... Rich young ruler here. Now, by the way, I'm going to tell you something. The Lord, chapter 12, the Lord said this to who? The disciples. Who's speaking here? The Lord. I think he knows what he's talking about. I don't think we, I think the verses are clear that he knows what he's asking to be done here. Not figuratively. See, man does that, oh, figuratively. No, spiritually, you know, spiritualize it. No, the Lord literally is saying this. He says this. 
So I think I'll let the Lord be true and let everybody else do their thing. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Ye uh, yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he knew he was just spiritualizing it and literally didn't mean it. What's the reaction from the guy? He believed that what the Lord literally was saying for him to do what? Go down and empty out the bank accounts. Sell the property. Why? Because he is sorrowful. For he was very rich. What's their program? Sell it out. Why? The kingdom of heaven's at hand. It's right there. It's coming. You sell out. You make that commitment. You remember what discipleship is in the, in the earthly ministry? You don't get nothing. You give it up. You give all of it up. You don't keep a little bit back. Come on over to Acts 2. i got to get going. Acts 2. Ay, ay, ay. I told myself, stay on point. Stay on. But, but folks, this stuff, why do they collect up the poor saints? Because these guys have been believing the word of God to them in the moment. Acts chapter 2. By the way, Acts 2 is a continuation of nothing new here. Acts 2, Peter stands. He's preaching, speaking in tongues. Verse number 43. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were to continue and had all things common and sold their possessions and good and parted them to all men as every man had need. That's a continuation of the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Sell it all. Bring it to the apostles, and they're going to distribute it as every man has need. By the way, verse 46, And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, and eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. You see, they were all together with this. There wasn't one piece doing it and the other piece not. They're praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Chapter 3, verse 6, What is Pe Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Why wouldn't he? Because he's cashed out. He laid it down there, distributing to the necessities of everybody, all men. You want to see what, how communism works? <laughs> the true sense of it? There's an idea. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, Peter again here. Chapter 4, verse 34. By the way, I picked Peter because Peter's the big guy. Everybody follows Peter. Peter, 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 Peter. Well, guess what Peter did? He picked up on the message that Christ had delivered and taught them to preach, and he's still doing it in Acts. We're in Acts 4. Nothing changed here. Same message. Why? Because the kingdom is right there. 434. Neither was there lacking, I'm, I'm sorry, neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted, the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. What's he doing? Talks cheap, folks. He didn't go over there and cash in one building and leave another. He cashed out. He brought it and laid it at Peter's feet. Chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And you know what happened to them? You see, talk's cheap. It's serious. This is serious business. It cost them their lives. Why? Because they lied to who? The Holy Ghost. 
You remember Matthew 12. You blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you're never forgiven. These people, Ananias and Sapphira, you know where they went? They went to hell. The lake of fire is where they're going. Well, but Rick, they did it. No, they didn't do it. They did a piece of it. The stuff is serious. Why are they poor? Because they believe the messianic message of selling out and God will take, I'll take care of you in the kingdom. So you know what they did? They did it. They laid it at apostles' feet. Peter, Think about Peter. Peter's preaching this message. And then God changes the message on him. So he's got to write Second Peter to explain why it didn't happen. Because you know what, you know what people will do. Yeah, Pete, you just put it in the bank account, man. Yeah, we know what happened. Peter's living over here. He's riding and he's on the big hill at the house on the big hill. No, he didn't. He did what? He distributed. By the way, they would have seen that he was distributing it. But the outsiders that attack from without. So Pete's on the hook here. So what happened? The kingdom doesn't come. Now they have nothing. They, by faith, what did they do? They sold out, literally, all of it. They laid it at, his, at the apostles' feet. There's no kingdom coming now. It's been interrupted. So now who's going to take care of us? What's going to happen here? What's going on here? Now they're in the bread lines. Now they're, what's happening? Could you imagine what the religious people are doing at this time? We told you that was a fraud. We told you Jesus Christ of Nazareth was a fraud. And look at what, you know how they're spinning it. See. But yet God's now going to do what? He's going to provide for them by demonstrating the glorious capacity and the glorious power of His grace in the lives of the Gentile believer, the body of Christ. Come on over to chapter 11 of Acts and watch Paul. He's going to use language here concerning helping the poor. And it's going to be very, it's, to me, it's very fascinating. Acts 11. Now, in Acts 11, look at verse 1. and the, Actually, just look over at verse 29. We'll start there. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Okay? You see the brethren that dwelt? That's the poor saints in Jerusalem. Because these guys, verse 30, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. These are, in verse 29, 27, 28, 29, actually the folks at Antioch there, they're body of Christ people. Okay? What did they determine to do? See how they're, we're early in Paul's ministry. Verse 1, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you see, what did they just witness? They witnessed their guy go to Cornelius. So what do they now know? Something's going on in the Gentiles. Those dogs, those unclean, stinking people over there, now some, God's doing something over there. You see how they're doing that? The people over there, there's a change in the program, and yet what does verse 29 say? The, people, the believing body of Christ Gentiles, what are, they, what are they wanting to do? Send relief. See that? There's some early understanding about the, the exceeding riches of God's grace. At the very beginning of the dispensation of grace, there is an effort to help the poor saints at Jerusalem. Again, financially. Even in the in this state of confusion here with the Jews and those in Judea, of what in the world's going on with the Gentiles? I mean, think about that. They just saw their program come to an end, be interrupted. Not an end, but interrupted. What's going on here? God's over there. He, he even took Peter, our guy, and went and talked to a Gentile. 
Could you imagine the confusion here? And yet, what's the Gentile believer doing? Body of Christ. Hey, let's, they need help, man. <laughs> they got a power bill coming, and we, we can send them a little, we're going to sell them some money here. We need to help them out. Come over to chapter 24 of Acts. Acts 24, verse 17. Paul is before Felix. And he says, now after many years, I come to bring alms to my nation and what? Offering. Look at that. Paul's in Jerusalem. He's in trouble. He's in the courtroom. And what does he say? You know why I'm here? I came to bring an offering from the gen churches of the Gentiles. They're wanting to help these poor saints over here. That's why I'm here, Felix. See that? I didn't come just to, to whistle Dixie and have a good time. I came with a purpose. Come over to 1 Corinthians 16. You see, Paul's language here, very clear. What did the poor saints, they believed their message, it got interrupted, and now God, through the Gentiles, he's going to, that gamble of grace, that risk of faith, that his grace, the Gentiles will catch on to their, the exceeding riches of his grace and go and help. I'm never going to command them to do it, but they'll go help. Look at 1 Corinthians 16. Look at verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, who are the saints here? Not the, not the local church at Corinth, the guys in Jerusalem. You see, this. when you read this stuff, he's not talking about the offering box this morning, which, by the way, is back there. You need to fill it up, okay? He's not talking about that. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Now, Corinth is not in Galatia. Corinth is in Macedonia. You see, the churches of Galatia over here, they've been doing it since early Acts. That's where Achaia is on the map. Now it's Macedonia church's time. Now we get over here, Thessalonians, Philippi, uh, Ephesus, all those guys. Now it's your turn. But watch him upon the first day of the week. Let every one lay by him in stores. God has prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. You see, people, the first day of the week, that's Sunday. So we have church on Sunday. See, boom, because then we can take up the collect. No, that's not what he's doing. What Paul's doing is he's setting things in order. Look, guys, when I get there, I don't want to have to wait for you to collect it up. So when you get together, make sure that collection is ready to go. It's in the, the lockbox, so we can go. Because when I get there, man, we're going. Why? Because I want to get down to Jerusalem and get this onward. Why? Because I'm going to Spain, man, and i got to go to Rome and Spain. i got a travel itinerary here. I don't want this to be dragging. See? Here's how it's going to be collected and handled. Verse 3, And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. See, we're taking this to Jerusalem. You get your, your little group of guys, your, your representatives together. By the way, they traveled this way for security. That's why. Because they load this stuff on the donkey and they got to walk it down there or they got to get on a boat. And so if they've got a big collection, which evidently they do, you know, it's like the wise men. There was more than three of them. There was like 50 of them, maybe. Security. By the way, verse 4, and if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. You know what Paul's original deal was? You guys go. You guys put the contingency. You go and take it. And if needed, I might go with you. I don't have to go. See how Paul's doing there? The responsibility isn't on Paul. It's on who? The churches of Galatia. The churches of Macedonia. It's not on Paul. But Paul says, by the way, this kills Calvin by the way, because Calvin says every little thing's preordained. Paul says, no way, Jack. If I get down there, maybe I'll go, maybe I won't. We'll see when I get there what happens. See? I don't know. Anyway, what he does here. Come over to Galatians 2. You see, your, liberty, your liberality to Jerusalem, here's how it's going to go. 
You're going to gather it together. You're going to get your contingency together. And then you guys are going to go. And if I'm, and I get there, and we can go at the same time because I'm going there too. See, you see, follow? Galatians 2. Galatians 2, this is the Acts 15 meeting. This is Paul's record of that meeting. Okay, Acts 15 is Luke's record. Luke sits in the audience and watches. So you get Luke's give you everything that happens up on the stage. Paul's going to get you it privately. Verse 2, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run in, should run or had run in vain. You see, Luke, Paul's going to talk, the private meeting, behind the closed doors. Here's the secretary notes of what happened, verse 9. And when James, Cephas, obviously that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. What they perceive? They perceive Paul's unique apostleship, his message, his ministry, and what he was doing, what, what God was doing through him. What they do? They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. Right hand of fellowship. You remember that little thing in Matthew and the Gospels where the Lord says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven? What'd they just do? They bound the deal. You're going to the heathen, Paul, the unbelieving Jew, the unbelieving Gentile. We're going to sit with the circumcision and get them ready because Acts 15, we know that God's just visiting the Gentiles and we're back on the play. See what's going on here? They got that. They perceived it. They gave Paul the right hand of fellowship. You know what they did there? They literally loosed themselves from their apostle, apostolic duty. See that? Power. Big stuff going on here. Not just a little verse that they like to change the gospel of to the gospel to, you know, and all that. Verse 10. Only they would that we should remember the who. Who, the poor who? Well, the homeless people? Not at all. The poor who? The poor saints at Jerusalem. Now watch. The same which I also was forward to do. I want you to notice something in verse 10. Only they would that we should remember. No command. A simple request. Paul, we see what's going on with the poor. We see, I'm sorry, we see what's going on with your ministry, and God has, has interrupted our program, and I, we're just asking you to remember the poor. And you know what Paul said? I was already doing it. I've been doing it since day one. By the way, verse 11, But when Peter was in Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Pete, Paul exercised apostolic authority over Peter, not the other way around. Peter makes no demand of Paul. He just says, Paul, Barnabas, as you guys go, just remember the poor. When you run across a poor saint, just help them out. When you go to Acts 15, we're not going to do it. And then you know what you see? When they write the letters, and they, by the way, in Acts 15, they write letters and they send great contingencies. A great number of guys go with Paul from the circumcision church there. And they're validating that we support what Paul is doing, his ministry and his message. Now, if they can get that, what's wrong with you and I today? We know no better. We actually are dumber, if you will, scripturally, than they were. And yet, what did they do? They said, Paul's the guy. Paul's the one where God's working today. You look around the Christianity today, and they got you back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just listen, if the adversary knows where God's working, what is your problem? Not, not you personally, okay? Just, all right? I, I think about that. I mean, man, you just don't. Anyway, 2 Corinthians 8. Time, 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 Rick. 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8. Why are they poor? They've been following the word of God to them and their program. God interrupted that program. He's doing something else. So what did now Paul do? Paul is demonstrating the riches of God's grace amongst the Gentiles. And you know what he's doing? He's collecting up an offering to take over. Why? Because here the Gentiles are now the superior. 
And what is their obligation? To receive them that are weaker. So let's go help them. And again, you can't do this today. If you want to send your money to Jerusalem, go ahead. That's your business. But it isn't helping anybody but, but a bank in Jerusalem. It really isn't. I saw a guy one, uh, anyway, <laughs> 2 Corinthians 8. The Corinthians now, think about the Corinthians. They have a lot of problems. They have a lot of growth. But in 2 Corinthians, you begin to see them begin to make the corner. And when we get over there in about 10 years, we'll, we'll see it, okay? When, when they make the corner, and you know what? They don't want to be left out now. In 1 Corinthians 16, they were struggling with it. They didn't understand what to do. Paul set it in order how he wanted it done. Now in 2 Corinthians 8, they are, they, they're like, hey, we want to participate in this now. Verse 1, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of where? You remember it was the churches of Galatia first. Now we're in the churches of the Macedonians. Okay, by the way. Notice, we do you to wit the, the what? The grace of God. Verse 9, just real quick. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. 9, 14. And by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you. Do you see that issue there? Paul is not pressing a command to do this. He's like, Let, guys, let's be motivated by God's grace. All of this is in context of that collecting for the poor saint in Jerusalem. They were commanded to sell out. In all this now, there's no command to provide the relief for them. How are we going to do it? God's grace. Verse 14, 914. And by their prayer for you, their prayer, the poor saints in Jerusalem, which long after you, they, they're bankrupt. They have nothing. And you know what they're doing? They're looking at the Gentiles who they scolded who they ridiculed, who they said were not important. And they're looking over there, and you know what they're doing? They're longing after you for the what? The exceeding grace of God. You know what they're looking for? They're looking for you to function on the basis of God's grace. Not based on the past. And God is confident he provided for the little flock, he will, but now he's going to do that how? Well, God's grace is going to compel the very group of people who through history were cut off, they were outcasts, they were unclean, they were enemies, and yet what are they going to do? Provide for the believing remnant. Man, that is God's grace. That's the only way that could happen. Now look at verse 13. Whiles by, now watch this, by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your pro professed subject, subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer, you see that thing about an experiment? When the offering plate came by, what verse 13 is talking about, there's an experiment we're going to get to, but that liberal distribution, when the offering plate comes by, the issue isn't how much you put in the, book, in the plate. The issue is the need over there. Okay? Now, we function on the amount, 10%, right? That's not we on the need. You remember the widow and her little mite? The Lord's watching them, watching the offering, the, the, the collection. And he says, she gave of that might, she gave of all. Where the other guy comes by and he just gives a couple pennies or whatever. No, she sacrificed it all. That's the issue here. It isn't the, the amount, it's the need. It's an experiment. Now go back to 8.1. Chapter 8, verse 1. 
Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Again, Philippi, Thessalonians, the Thessalonian, uh, uh, Thessalonia, uh, the Corinthians in that area. Verse 2, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. Now think about that trial, experiment. We got a connection going on here. What did these brethren of Macedonia do here? By the way, when you're going to have a tri- when you're going to have an experiment, you know what you're doing? You're doing two things. One, you're trying to discover the unknown, and two, you're trying to prove something that is known. So what do you do? You got a trial. You're going to work this out. What is unknown here? There is an unknown element. It's called the risk of faith. It's called the risk of grace, the gamble of grace. Because God doesn't, he's not making a, Paul is not making a demand that you give. He just says, I'm going to beseech you to do this. That's a risk. Because what could the group say? Nope, ain't going to help them. They deserve what they get. Because look at what they did to me on January 5th, and you know, and pull the old car. That means what? It's not working, the grace of God. Right? Their maturity level. You see, you've got to try. But by the way, what is known? What is the known element here? The grace of God. You see how this is? You with me? You see, that's what Paul's getting at in Romans 15. Look, guys, you need to be operating on the doctrines learned of the book of Romans here. Oh, where do we go? Where do we stop? Verse 2. By the way, deep poverty. The Macedonian churches, they were poor themselves. If you drop down to verse 8, I speak not by command. See that? I speak not by what? Commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Wow, that is that element of grace. The motivation of love and gratitude, the sincerity of your love. The Gentile church, no command. How did, how did God receive you? By His grace. How are you going to go help these brethren? By His grace. Verse 24, 824, Wherefore show ye to them and before the churches, notice, the proof of, the trial, the experiment, the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. Paul's out there saying, hey, God's grace is going to work on them, and he's bragging about the Corinthians. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) They hadn't done it, and now they're wanting to be involved. I'm bragging on God's grace working in them. Now go back up to verse 2. Deep poverty, verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. You know what they did? They collected up. They come to Paul. Paul says, listen, you guys need this money to pay your bills. They begged Paul, don't deny us the opportunity to prove the exceeding riches of God's grace. Don't deny us the ability to participate in the fellowshipping and the helping out here. How dare you, Paul, say no when you're de- you we want don't deny us. You c- come over to Philippians. I know it's time's up, but you just got to see this. Look at Philippians 1. Don't, and you know what, folks, I tell you, that's what the offering box is. Your opportunity to demonstrate God's grace, your understanding, what the doctrine is. It isn't to pay, you know, to do any of this. I mean, we have a small campus. (laughs) Okay? Well, it fits, it works. It's not that. It's just, how do I prove the sincerity of my love? Philippians 1, look at verse 4. uh, Verse. Uh, four, always in every prayer of mine for you, always making requests with joy 
for from, for you your I'm sorry for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now and you go over to chapter 4 and he's talking about money he's talking about them giving not once and but twice when he was at Thessalonica and them financially supporting so much so that that their own guy comes going to bring the gift that he thought they were lacking he hung out and worked with Paul for a while that's chapter 3 <sighs> Chapter 3, chapter 2, sorry, verse 25, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow servant, fellow soldier, but your minister and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all with fullness of head, because that he had heard that he had been, that he had heard that he had been sick, for indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy and see, he come. What did he do? Verse 30, because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. That's why he was there, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward. Hey, you know what Epaphroditus said? That wasn't a big enough check going to Paul. So I'm going to go and I'm going to work on another half of it. Now go back to 2 Corinthians 8 because we've got to finish this up. You know what they're saying to Paul? They're begging Paul. Take it. Don't deny us the opportunity to put on display the trial, the experiment, the proof of God's grace and what we understand to have happened. Verse 5, 8, 5, And this they did, not as we hoped. I mean, Paul's sitting there going, Guys, you got holy knees in your jeans, man. You got holes in your jeans. <laughs> You go buy a new pair of jeans. And you're like, no, nope, no, nope, we'll just patch them up. We'll go down to the dollar store and get a patch. Ain't no big deal. Why? Because, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the Lord. Where did they first go? Right to the message to the Lord. Lord, we understand what happened dispensationally. We understand where we are. Come back to Romans 15. And that is literally what he says in verse 27. What do we understand? We're now partaking of the spiritual things. It's now our what? Duty to help out with the carnal things. And we're glad to do it. And you know what Paul says? You've proved the sincerity of your love. You proved that God's gamble on grace, you proved that his gamble on his grace working is right there. In Romans 15, Paul says, you're going to take all that doctrine and you're going to put it on display. You see this illustration here. In human flesh, in time, here it is. You're to receive one another. Why? You were received. You're the, now go receive the poor saints at Jerusalem. Now you and I, again, we can't do this, but we can learn from the illustration of it. Okay. Now, in verse 29, he's going to finish out the chapter, and we're going to try and do that next time. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you've done for us. And, Lord, I just pray that in our mindsets and our thinkings that we, too, will then demonstrate, prove, put on display the exceeding riches of your grace. In your name we pray. Amen.